Okay, uh, well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Lovely to be in Guam, especially in lovely weather in Oregon. Oh, especially for you. <laughs> Not much different. Though. Okay, so uh, anyway, um, I guess you could say this talk will be sort of applied mathematics. Because uh, these uh, multiple state values, alternate multiple state values, came up uh, in the night. Problem with just evaluating the integral, basically, you know, a series for integral. But uh, nevertheless, uh, some interesting results about um, multiple zeta values uh, sort of come into play, and there's going to be conjecture at the end. So they're sort of famous for those. So. so I'll introduce you to the problem first and uh, what the sort of first cut at look, look, look like. And then um, I'll show how you can actually get this asymptotic series as a, just a linear combination of alternate and multiple zeta values. And then it turns out, uh, because of some uh, old identities of uh, Pilbik's from the 1980s, you can actually write it in terms of ordinary zeta values. Uh, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about a conjecture that kind of grew out of thinking about this, although it turns out you don't actually need it, but perhaps uh, this might be interesting for future research. All right, so most of this talk is, is joint with uh, Guy Lushar, Marcus Puba, and Modi Levy. Um, and uh, first thing I want to do is just establish notation for multiple zeta values. So uh, I think everybody here knows about multiple zeta values, but uh, I use the convention where, um, you know, these M1 is the biggest one, so uh, zeta 2 1 converges, and zeta 1 2 1 doesn't, but okay. And then uh, you can extend this definition a little bit by putting signs in the numerator. So if you put a bar over one of these entries, it means you have a corresponding sign. Um, all right, so these are sometimes called colored multiple zeta values, or I, I call them alternating ones. Um, they actually, uh, I suppose in some sense, precede the multiple zeta values in the sense that there's already a physics paper from, I think, 1987 or 88 that has one of these in it. Of course, that was before anybody was talking about multiple zeta values. Oh, Euler. Except, well, but, but one, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure Euler didn't call it. I don't know what it would do to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but anyway. Uh, all right, so uh, the alternating ones actually, so in the regular ones, convergence, you have to have that first entry to bigger, bigger than one. Uh, the alternating ones will converge unless the first entry is an unbarred one. So in fact, if you put uh, zeta one bar, converges to minus logarithm two, and uh, if you put a number bigger than two, uh, you get something that's just a multiple of the zeta band. And all right, so that's just notation. Now, our combinatorial problem. So suppose you take this integral i n, integral from zero to one, the one over nth power of x to the n plus one minus x to the n. Uh, so this has, for example, you can interpret it as the expected value of the random variable u to the n plus one minus u to the n to the one over n, where u is uniform zero, one. And actually part of this joint paper under, under development is, uh, there's a whole section about interpretations of this in terms of expected values and moments of distributions, but that's the boring part, so I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, anyway. Uh, it was dealish I got, got the ball rolling by looking for an asymptotic series for this in reciprocal powers of n. Uh, and basically I saw his paper in the archive and looked at the way he got the first few of them and said, I can do better than that. Got the next few and then more people got involved and the next thing you know you're ready to make paper. But anyway, uh, anyway, let me just show show you roughly uh, the way 
uh, Yiddishai did it in his first paper. Okay, so first you use the symmetry about a half, uh, write it that way. Uh, you could make this change a variable, then you get this sort of messy thing. And then, uh, okay, you write this as, uh, you know, exponential of a logarithm, you can pull the n down and then expand the exponential in series and lots more algebraic steps. The first few terms uh, in powers of one over n look like this after quite a bit more manipulation. And then if you'll notice that you got a one here, so you can separate that off. That'll give you the, this uh, I zero. And then the rest of it, it's going to be in powers of 1 over n. So, uh, well, so the, the, your first term, the 1 over 2n just cancels out with the integral. You get 3 quarters. The rest of it, you can write like this. Expand everything out into integrals. Pull the uh, denominators in n outside. And then take the upper limit to infinity. Get your asymptotic series. All right, so after you multiply this out, you're going to have some integrals to do. Okay. So the first one, well, okay, Maple will do this one. That's, that's one. <laughs> well, this next one takes a little more work. Uh, you got things a little strange here. And it turns out there's actually some results you can show about uh, integrals of this kind, power of u times a power of log of 1 plus e to the minus u in terms of alternating multiple zeta values. So in, in this next case, I3, okay, you get some alternating multiple zeta values, but evaluates just to a multiple of zeta 3. Okay, so uh, it's just 1a to zeta of n, right? Well, no. The next term, well, there's more things to do. There's three terms. And you can still get it all in terms of alternating multiple zeta values, but okay, uh, Coefficient isn't just one eighth anymore. Uh, so already, and, and by the way, uh, zeta two bar is minus one half of uh, zeta two. So you can there's a, there's a there's a regularity appearing in the expression in terms of the alternating multiple zeta values, if not the apparently the final result. So notice. Uh, well, okay. this is, if, if I show you the next two, um, mm -hmm. so, 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 so as, as the, the farthest that uh, uh, Guy was able to get in his first paper was the I5. Mm -hmm. And he didn't write it exactly this way, but you can write it out in terms of alternating multiple zeta values like that. Uh, okay, well, when you reduce that to no, <coughs> by known formulas for these alternating ones, Okay, you destroy the hope that it's a rational multiple of zeta of n. Uh, but uh, the, the, the underlying regularity in the pattern of the alternating ones uh, <laughs> continues. Okay? The, 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 the sign changes sort of with each step. But, you know, this, this sequence, uh, sort of 2 minus 1, minus 1, 2, is continuing. And uh, the next one. Okay, so, so the first one I, uh, that he couldn't get that I computed was this. And, okay, it's now the next number. If you notice, after this first one, these two, these numbers sort of come in pairs. So, uh, you get this thing, and uh, this is the first one where there's sort of more than one term when you reduce it. Uh, but already to get to this stage, uh, you need sort of a whole bunch of lemmas about, you know, how to reduce these various functions that appear, how to integrate these various functions that appear. And uh, actually, the first version I had a little bit wrong, and then when I redid it, uh, I had to add a whole bunch more lemmas. <laughs> more, more terms come out when you expand out the integral the way it was done here. But that's actually not the way to expand it. So. <laughs> This first substitution is actually not sort of the best way to do it. So, let, yeah. So just these lines with stripes, 
the last one is what you'd expect because it's a two-dimensional space. Then the previous one is no zeta phi. It's very sort of surprising. Right. Uh, that that's that's basically sorry a feature of the reduction from the alternating ones to the ordinary zeta phi. But it's not. I mean, so are there certain zeta phi that can never occur? Um, can't say for sure, but I, I, I will in fact be able to give you algorithmic ways to compute both these guys and these guys by the end of the talk. Okay. But I'll tell you, tell it to you a bit at a time. All right. So. Yes, sir. Yeah. But, so in the case four, I think if you replace theta four by theta two two, then you also have the factor one over eight. So did you also try, for example, write these? Can you? Did you try to write it always one over eight? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I wrote it lots of ways. Integer coefficients. It, it turns out this one over eight is is kind of an accident. Um, I, I don't don't attribute too much significance to it. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's there if you like in front of the alternating expression. That it's it's natural here. It's it's not really natural at the end result. But anyway, well, let me talk about sort of the first stage of this, which is this pattern actually is not too hard to establish once you sort of hit on the right substitution. So let's let, let's talk about that next. Oh well, wow, okay. So. The, the <laughs> apparent regularity, such as it is, it seems to be occurring in the, the fact that you get the sum of alternating multiple zeta values. I haven't quite told you what the coefficients are yet, but uh, that's sort of neat. And it also appears you can write it as a polynomial in the zeta i's. Now, you might say, well, well so what? You only took it up to six. Uh, you know, multiple zeta values themselves don't get weird until you get to weight eight. You know, the first multiple zeta value you can't reduce to polynomials and the regular ones is your zeta 2, 6. Uh, but actually things go bad with, with these guys, with the alternating ones right away, sort of already wait four. Uh, zeta 3, 3 bar 1 doesn't appear to have an expression, a rational expression in terms of those constants. It's, it's sort of a new thing. Uh, so clearly in order to get zetas at the end, see already, already at this stage, you know, this sort of bad guy came up, it gets canceled by a term here. So. And there's lots more cancellation that goes on the further up. So even at I6, there's a lot of sort of exotic stuff that cancels out. Could there be a bar over the two? No, I'm sorry, yeah, that, that's a misprint. There, there should be a bar over I, the two. Sure. Just the leading one. So it's always K bar and then one. So yeah, yeah, right. that's always K. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, what, what, what you might guess by looking at these expressions is you can always write it as uh, a linear combination of alternating ones with just bar in the first place, ones elsewhere, and it all cancels out somehow to some kind of polynomials and regular zeta values. And that's true. Uh, both facts are true. But it uh, took some while to get there. All right. So let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, how you could actually reduce the original integral to the sum of alternating ones. Well, the right substitution to make uh, after you do the one-half symmetry is actually uh, u equals x over 1 minus x. And that turns the integral into this. <laughs> Get back to the interval 0, 1. And then expand this guy out. Uh, you know, write this as exponential of log, bring the 1 over n down, expand the log exponential in a series. You get that. And now uh, you use the fact that, okay, uh, if you expand out powers in the logarithm, you get just, uh, you know, that's a generating function for Sterling numbers of the first kind. So. And these are, these are signed Sterling numbers of the first kind. Uh, okay, so, so, so first, uh, first uh, revision from the initial approach is use this substitution instead, expand it out of the series, uh, use the uh, Sterling number generating function. And then if you put that generating function into the series, well, this is the expression you get. So right away, that, that one at the beginning, you know, separates out the three-quarter term. That's this integral. And then you have a series like this. OK, and, and notice all you're integrating now is just powers of u over 1 plus u cubed from 0 to 4. Okay, now, if you define truncated multiple zeta values, the subscript indicates a, a maximum on the, uh, how big the first, the big one can get. Uh, it's actually pretty well known that uh, 
See, then you don't have to worry about convergence. In particular, you can take these i's to be all ones. And in fact, what do you get when you put all ones in a truncated series? You get Stirling numbers. Right? Most people know that. I, I don't know. <laughs> Multiple zeta value kind of sense, you know that. Uh, yeah, except for some factorials and signs and stuff. Uh, anyway. So, you could, in other words, you could replace this Stirling number with a truncated multiple zeta value. Okay, fine. And then uh, our expression, you have a constant front, you got all this mess. And now you can do your asymptotic <laughs> expansion just with this. So let's say the asymptotic expansion of u to the r over 1 plus u cubed, u from 0 to 1, in powers of 1 over r looks like that. We'll figure out these constants in a minute. Uh, then you, write this, you can write the series like this. So uh, it's mn here, so this became uh, you know, 1 over mn to the j, and then you already had n to the k and m there. Okay. And now uh, you can rearrange this summation into, in fact, alternating multiple zeta values, uh, as we do on the next slide. Because Look, the point is, you got powers of m, and then you got all ones, you know, up to m minus one. So you can just put this into a alternating one. That power goes there. There's your string of ones. You got these coefficients, whatever they are, and then okay, it's a sum and n, which means okay, the constant term in your asymptotic expansion is three quarters. We knew that. The one over n term is zero. We knew that. But the remainder, the ones for p bigger than or equal to 2, you can now write in this form, which you, you know, change your summation variable, and it looks like that. So now we have them written as certain coefficients times alternating multiple zeta values with you know, bar in the first spot. So that's neat. Yeah. Can you remind what beta was? Because a beta. I haven't figured out yet. The next few slides will do that. But no, but beta is just defined by this expansion. So the asymptotic expansion of this. U over R uh, over 1 plus U cubed 0 to 1. And the, I, I, the, the offset here is just for convenience. OK, so, so what are these betas? If we know the betas, we know the whole thing in terms of alternating ones. Well, OK. It turns out they're just expressible in terms of values of, these are Euler polynomials. So it's just a sum of two values of minus one of the Euler polynomial times appropriate constant. And it's not too hard to give a, a, a slick little proof of that. Uh, what you do is first change variables. This is what you have to expand out to get the betas. Let u be e to the minus t. Okay, so you can rewrite it like that. Okay, so now the, the, the equation at the bottom of the page there is just a computation. Take the derivatives uh, and you know, subtract when you get that. And now take your generating function for the other polynomials. Okay. Uh, so that's the generating function for the Euler polynomials. Uh, set x equal to negative 1, change this i on t, and then compute the two derivatives that appear here. And you could you know, write those out in terms of these guys, values of basically the Euler function, Euler polynomial expansion at uh, x equal to minus 1. And then, okay. Uh, these are subtracted here, so this there's a minus sign here, so that goes away. So that's why this becomes a sub instead of a difference, and that means that when you write out this integral, it just becomes this. And now, okay, you've just got this sum of values of Euler polynomials, and what is this? Oh my goodness, it's a Laplace transform of t to the other word vectorial. <laughs> so you know what that is. Uh, and there's your, there's your series. Okay, so that's the proof of uh, the, the, the letter that tells you what those coefficients that we 
uh, expansion arc. And so now here's my formula for the I's, capital I's, in terms of these. Yes, sir. So this is a divergence here. No, or, or you just, you, maybe you lost the antifactorial? No, you didn't lose the antifactorial. So From here to here, I, the Laplace transform. Yeah, it gives you then, but that means that this is a divergence series. Yes, it's, it's, it's an asymptotic series, yeah, so we don't care. No, they don't. We don't care about divergence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, so the point is, I explicitly have what these coefficients are. But that's sort of a stupid way to write them, actually, because now we just play around with Euler polynomials a little bit. Uh, there's a basic identity for Euler polynomials. If you set x equal to negative 1 in that formula, you find that uh, e sub n of minus 1 is just 2 to the minus 1 in the n minus the value of uh, e at 0. So that sum that appears here uh, is just going to be, OK, because it's adjacent values of n, these terms will cancel. So that will go away. And then, uh, well, the thing about values of the Euler polynomials at 0 is uh, half the time they're 0 because en is 0 if n is even. So, uh, you know, half the time you're getting uh, the negative of the 0 a value of ej, and half the time you're getting the negative value of uh, ej minus 1. So you could write that all a little more slickly. Let's just let a sub n be half the value uh, at 0 of the other polynomial uh, 2n plus 1. And then uh, you got a formula for ip in terms of these a's. So that's sort of the slick way to write it. The, the, this, just, this just needs floor, so greatest integer less than j minus 1 over 2. OK, so now we've got a nice slick formula for these things in terms of the alternate. Uh, what about these numbers a sub n? Well, you know, there's stuff you can say about them. Uh, that's on the next slide. You can write out the generating function just by fiddling around with the one for Euler numbers. So there's the generating function. From the generating function, you can see that these guys are actually expressible as Bernoulli numbers, multiples of Bernoulli numbers. And here are the first few. They go minus 1 quarter, 1 half, minus 1 quarter, 17 sixteenths, minus 31 quarters, 691 over 8. And can they be expressed as alternate in times? Yeah, in a nice way. Oh, gee. <laughs> um, uh, I, can't, I, I can't, can't tell you. But it looks like an even zero value with a Euler factor for them. Yeah, I. <clears throat> I actually was doing these the hard way, uh, except when you when you see 691 <laughs> come up, you sort of know there's Bernoulli numbers in there somewhere. <laughs> Bernoulli numbers are real tricky, but you know this one is kind of special. It's you know, large prime, so. <laughs> but anyway, here's here's the first five of them, and okay, so I showed you the you know up to i sub six. Well, okay, so now here's i eleven. Just, you just took, take the numbers. Remember, it's uh, in the formula, this is you know, greatest integer below uh, j minus 1 over 2. So you see that these, these do occur in pairs. And, you know, so, so as I was working these out by hand, you know, at first, you know, you know we factored out our names, remember. But you know, okay, so it was, we don't like getting twos, and then ones, and then twos again. Uh, and then this was sort of awkward. And, that was, and then 691 came up. Well, okay. Had to be Bernoulli numbers somehow. All right, so that's I11, uh, written out as a sum of alternating ones. Uh, does it reduce to polynomial in the ordinary zeta values? By golly, it does. There's nothing particularly uh, attractive about the coefficients, but this is a polynomial in the Ordinary zeta values. Okay, so that sort of brings us to the second part of the problem, which is uh, we have now an expression for the numerators in this asymptotic series as uh, 
alternating z values we know the coefficients. Uh, the question is, can you always reduce that to a polynomial in just zeta value, ordinary zeta values? Well, yeah, you can. That's the second sort of major step here. And uh, these go back to, as it turns out, uh, some papers by uh, K.S. Colby from the 1980s. Now, this was sort of before multiple zeta values were a thing. So none of this, none of, in his papers, you don't say anything about multiple zeta values or series or anything. He writes them all. He, all the results are, are phrased in terms of, of what he calls Nielsen poly, uh, hyper logarithms or something like that. Nielsen's generalized uh, logarithmic integral, I think he calls it. Uh, so he, he was interested in this function. So you take uh, log the n minus first power of log t against the p power of log uh, 1 minus z t one of, times 1 over t dt uh, integrated from 0 to 1. And this is, of course, just a normalization. And he's got results about the values of this, mostly at uh, z equals 1 and z equals negative 1. Okay, well, here's the thing. Uh, these are actually all, either multiple zeta or alternating multiple zeta values if z is plus or minus 1. And they're quite simply expressible. This so-called s sub n p of z is just this, which, of course, reduces to a multiple zeta value if uh, z is 1. It becomes an alternating multiple zeta value if z is minus 1. OK, so. Uh, why is that so? It, that this is a little, a little uh, bit of calculus this fun. Is than just a if, if z is one, it's even one that's no yeah, yeah. Yeah. form. Exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Sure. Uh, okay, so this is a little exercise uh, that you can give to your calculus students, I guess. <laughs> you, you know a series for log of one minus z t. Uh, this one is pretty easy to do too. Uh, after change of variable, that's just a Laplace transform again. Uh, so uh, you can expand this whole thing out, and you'll get, uh, you know, you use this uh, p times, uh, so you get all these factors. And then you got to use this result, and then you write it like that. And so you have a, a series, a p fold series like this. Uh, and then, uh, well, you want to rearrange that. So uh, if, you're, if you're me, you use this uh, lemma from my 1992 paper, uh, which allows you to rearrange this. You know, this is just a series where I1, IP can be any positive integers. Well, you can put them in increasing order using my rearrangement lemma, or not that I claim any great originality for it. I mean, it's just a little combinatorial thing. Uh, but anyway. It becomes this, and then the point is that uh, all these constants that came up, the factorials and the signs that uh, Colby put in his definition, exactly cancel all this, all this stuff out, and you get the result. Okay, so if I set uh, z equal to one, I've got a multiple zeta value, not just any old multiple zeta value, but one in, one in which the only the first uh, number in the exponent list is bigger than one, uh, what's sometimes called a, a height one multiple zeta value. And if that first, that sorry, that uh, z is negative one, then you just have a bar on the first entry, so you get this. So, so the two numbers Colbeck was mostly writing about were height one multiple zeta values and the ones that come up in the series for our integral. <clears throat> so it was, it was sort of like he was, uh, doing just what we needed for this paper, only didn't know it. But anyway, what about these? These are not just any old multiple zeta values. They're quite well known. Their generating function is known. Here's our friend the gamma function from this morning. Uh, just the plain old uh, analytic gamma function. And you can write this combination of, of gamma functions in terms of values of the zeta function. Which means, therefore, that all these height one guys are exactly rational polynomials in zeta two, zeta three, and so on. Okay, so that's cool. So we sort of know all about these guys. 
And these are the ones we would sort of like to know more about. Okay, so why Koblenz's result is useful is because in one of his papers, uh, he has this identity. I, I, I should mention that uh, this, these papers of Koblenz pretty much grew out of some much older work by uh, Nielsen from uh, early 20th century. And uh, Nielsen had a bunch of identities in his paper, but unfortunately only some of them are true. Um, but we'll, we'll get to one of his true results later. But he's actually got some uh, false statements about the relationship between these two guys. So Kolbig sorted that out, and he proved that they satisfy these relations with these abundant field coefficients. OK, so the, these, these are the high one guys. These are well known. These are the somewhat more mysterious ones. You know, up, up to a side multiple, these are the ones at minus one. <clears throat> so you have this system. You can always write uh, the height one guys in terms of these uh, sigmas, these little slightly more mysterious ones. But uh, this, is, this system is, is not invertible. I mean, it's, it's, it's easily seen to be dependent. And of course, you wouldn't expect it, because for example, sigma 2, 2 is uh, zeta 3 bar 1. I've already mentioned that's not sort of expressible in terms of normal constants. So you, know, you wouldn't expect this to be able, you, you wouldn't be able to write this in terms of these things. Otherwise, uh, people would have already figured out how to survive. Okay, but it is true, certainly, that certain combinations of these sigmas can be written in terms of the, the, the SNPs, which are you know, the height one zeta values. So, oops, wrong there. Okay. Okay, so let me just rewrite in, in, in uh, Kolbe's notation what, what our IPs are. So, you write them in terms of the sigmas this way. Kolbig's relations are these. So if we can get some linear combination of these guys to be equal to uh, this, then we'll be cool. We'll have written it in terms of height one multiple zeta values. Uh, you know, this is, you, as I say, this, it's, it's a dependent system, so you wouldn't expect these, these uh, necessarily have a solution. But actually, it does. And it actually is because there's, you know, sort of a symmetry in the system. So that even though in general you can't solve for the rows, you can in this case. The trick is that if you impose this relation on these rows, then the symmetry uh, allows, you know, one term sort of goes into the other and your system reduces to this. Now, this system is still dependent, but the point is that if you restrict to like about half the values, it depends on whether it's even or odd, but if you restrict to about half the values, you get a system with a unique solution. Okay, so, you know, if I take the things with this symmetry, do I get this? Well, what if I just extend this formula for all k's between 0 and p minus 1 instead of this restricted range? Uh, the question is, is that consistent with that symmetry condition? And the answer is, uh, I can solve this for sort of half the cases. And then if I just extend this formula by running k up to p minus 1, is that consistent with this? And the answer is actually it is. It's another Euler polynomial identity. So if you like to collect Euler polynomial identities, here's another one for you. Uh, it sort of looks kind of pretty if you write it that way. But, it, but this is nothing deep. What you do is you take that identity. Uh, I had several slides back where uh, you had the uh, value. Excuse me? No, no, this actually works. That's a, uh, no, sorry. That's a P. That's a P. That doesn't contain P, except as a sign. And the right hand side doesn't contain any of Well, except for the signs. You yeah, well, you, you can move, you can swap signs around. Right. No, but, but both sides, if up to sign, now the side depends on N or P, so you're just saying this number is always the same. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not, it's maybe not the, the, the 
So you're just saying it's a constant? It's yeah. The same? yeah. So it's not an algebra, right? It's zero or one. What, whatever it is. It, 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 for, 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 for proving this fact, you, no, but it's an odd way to write, instead of writing a n is constant, you're writing a n is a p. Yeah, well, okay, I, I, I just, I just sell what a, a nice symmetrical way to write. But it's what you need to do this. Okay. All right, but the point is, we now, we, we, we now have, we, we, we now have an expression for what, how, how to combine uh, these guys to get, just the height one guys, and you plug it all in, you get this 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 point, or this this expression for I C P. Okay, so this actually solves the problem of writing this in terms of uh, polynomials and zeta values, although not explicitly because okay, this thing, yeah, it's expressible as a polynomial in the ordinary zeta values, but. Uh, the bottom is single to k plus one. No, there's no bottom. That's the whole point. This is an ordinary zeta value. Uh -huh. Okay, so the point is, this is a height one ordinary zeta value. It's it's a polynomial in the ordinary zeta values. It's not real obvious because you know it's it's given by this what it is. You expand this out in terms of the zeta i, and then you compare it term by term to that. So there's, I, I'm not aware of any really nice way to write that. Okay, the point is that it can be written that way, which, which kind of explains why your, uh, you know, your coefficients were so ugly when you wrote it in terms of polynomials and zeta values. There's no reason to expect them to be particularly simple. Plus, you got you know some combination of these formula number of things. So. Okay, but but anyway, that answers the question. Yeah, it's always expressible as a polynomial because these. Particular zeta values are polynomials and ordinary zeta values. Okay. Now that that answers all the questions about the alternating multiple zeta values that came from the actual problem. But now, in the process of thinking about the cancellation, uh, I sort of came up with the following conjecture. So let's say we take an alternating multiple zeta value. Again, of, of this type where it's the first the first entry is barred and the other entries are all ones. And let's say, but but let's say that first barred entry is even. Okay. So I claim, this is the conjecture, that it's a polynomial function of the ordinary zeta values. Minus an expression with rational coefficients. And what are those rational coefficients? They're coefficients of Euler polynomials. Uh, and now you've got the alternating zeta values where that first bar entry is odd and all the other entries are one. Okay, so this, this is, of course, just a conjecture. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's what, in the process, you know, before I had the arguments for, for Colby's paper, uh, I was just working with, uh, with, with uh, the, these sums, and uh, I, I sort of spent a long time staring at expressions of this kind. And where did I get those from? Well, uh, this conjecture is true up through weight 12, and it's because of the multiple zeta value data model which actually I think is a wonderful resource. Uh, so this is, uh, these are uh, actual tables that are available online. They were compiled by Johannes Blumlein, uh, David Bodhurst, and uh, Verma Saren. He's, he's the only one I don't know, but they're all physicists. Uh, and they, the, the, the tables are the result of symbolic computations, not numerical ones, but it's, it's uh, in terms of just zeta values, they go up quite a bit higher than weight 12. The alternating ones go up to weight 12. So uh, I have checked this conjecture up through weight 12. Uh, if you want to do this yourself, let me just warn you that last data file is enormous. Uh, after I decompressed it, it was like two and a half gigs or something. Uh, so, so to get the stuff out of it, that I needed the information. 
You could just open it with a text editor. Uh, I, had to, I had to scour the internet for some kind of utility that would read enormous files, just to get out the few lines of text in the file that I actually needed. But, uh, but anyway. Do you want plus one at the end? Excuse me? To match weights, uh, do you want plus one? For the last zeta? No, also n is n on the left. It's plus one. Ah, right. Yeah, it's plus one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. Yes, yes, that's plus one. Right. We find, we find the other misprint. Okay, so, so anyway, if you go back to this result, um, yeah, it's plus one here. But anyway. uh, if you go back to this result, and you, you'll notice that these sort of extra terms, the non-rational terms, don't pick up until the, uh, you know, the end here gets bigger than uh, m there, which means that if you just look at uh, 2m bar 1, it should be just a rational polynomial in the zeta. Yeah, actually it is. So uh, there's this identity, which is uh, one of the correct results in Nielsen's paper from 1909. Uh, in fact, uh, Kolbing reproved it. Uh, and uh, before I realized it was in Kolbing's paper, I proved it myself a different way. But you know. <laughs> so, 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 this, so this, this is actually a, a quite well-known identity in some sense. Um, but okay, so that, that, that does the case um, k equals one of the uh, conjecture, if you will. Uh, let me just, uh, this is an aside, but after fiddling around with the Nielsen identity, yeah, see, I got that right here, but anyway, uh, after fiddling around with that identity for a while, I found you could write it this way. If you put the zeta i and zeta i bars in. And if you, will, if you go up to the next case, okay, the case k equals 2 of the conjecture, uh, it appears that there's a somewhat similar but more complicated way to write it. So this hat, zeta i hat, means uh, zeta i if i is odd and uh, zeta i bar if i is even. Uh, and it's kind of hiding in there because the point is this whole expression, this, this weird coefficient here, uh, if you put it in front of zeta 2i, that's just minus zeta 2i bar. So, so, so the point is those, those coefficients in some sense all sort of disappear if you do this. Uh, so this is sort of a slick way to write Nielsen's identity. And then if you go up to kind of the next one, you have the first of those exotic terms coming in. And if you just substitute in what it is, it looks like that. And then it appears you can reorganize the other terms in, some kind of form like this. Uh, I wish I could say that. Uh, Does that continue? Yeah, I wish I could say it continues. Unfortunately, something something else is happening if you go up to like uh, one 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 or higher, because these simple tricks for the coefficients don't work anymore. There's there's something else that complicates these coefficients. Um, so. It appears, you, it appears maybe you can extend Nielsen's eyes. I also don't know how to get these yet, these rational numbers. Uh, but uh, it appears that perhaps, uh, if you're clever enough, you can kind of extend uh, this to sort of figure out what the, the rational part looks like, maybe. But that's still working work in progress. That's an aside. But anyway, the basic point is, uh, if you just take the case k equals 1 of the conjecture, it's true. Okay. No, but I, question? The, and this is not sort of generalization of this, has to be numerically proof in the next case. So the generalization is it's a rational linear from which we have four right. things, which are the sums of just one zeta hat, two zeta hats, or three with the total weight is what it should be. Yes, yes. And the next time you take those, so there are four expressions, is it a rational yeah. The problem so is that the, just the coefficients. No, without any code, it's just numerically. Is it true? If you do it on the computer, I, I, I haven't checked it with that. No, that should be. Then you don't need any database. You're talking about four numbers. Yeah, yeah. Not the gigabytes of numbers. It's, it's just that what, what's attractive about this is these coefficients are quite simple. So I was kind of hoping this would just come from some symmetric functions or something. Unfortunately, if you go up to, to three, there's rational coefficients on these guys, but they're they're not so simple anymore. So I don't sort of don't know what to do at that point. But anyway, it, it, does, it, it does seem possible that, you know, if you're clever enough, you could find 
uh, the rational expression. But okay, let me just say, okay, so the, the conjecture is consistent with, with uh, if you just got one one. And then if you take the identity of Kolbig I had before, if you just take this rather simple sum of these guys, in fact, not only do the exotic things cancel out, but uh, you just get a single zeta in there. Now, if you, if you take the expressions you get from this, from the conjecture, and say, what's the stuff that isn't rational? Well, it's exactly this sum of Euler numbers, and by golly, this is always zero because of the dumb Euler polynomial like that. You just don't really... So if you collect out all the sort of non-rational terms that occur here, you wind up with something you can write this way. And then that's, this thing is always zero because just setting x equals zero is Euler number identity. Okay, so that's a you know, test of consistency that the conjecture passes. And then Before, before we had the proof from Kolding's work of uh, what the, uh, that the, uh, the ice and peak could be written in terms of uh, just height one bold and zeta values, uh, I, I had this conjecture already, and so I uh, looked at the, uh, oops, uh, that's, yeah, okay. I, I looked at, okay, what is the non-rational stuff in IP that shows up? In other words, take my formula for IP in terms of the alternating ones, assume the conjecture, and see what it all adds up to, and you get this rather complicated <coughs> expression involving Euler polynomials again. But guess what? Uh, this is an Euler polynomial identity, again. <laughs> it's actually not all that hard to prove. Uh, if you want, you can uh, reduce it to a Bernoulli number identity, and then it, it sort of falls out by uh, just kind of uh, fiddling around with the generating function. So in other words, uh, the conjecture would imply that uh, the uh, sum of the alternating uh, multiple zeta values that occur from the integral is indeed a rational multiple of Of course, we don't need it anymore because we've proven that from uh, Kolbig's identity, but okay, this, that's another test of consistency that this uh, theorem passes. Okay, so I should say that uh, the generating function for these alternating guys, where it's just bar on the first part, what's everywhere else, is no. There it is. You might recognize it from earlier, okay? This is a hypergeometric function, Gauss hypergeometric function, evaluated minus one. So this generating function is known. So, you know, maybe the smart way to prove the conjecture is just to somehow very cleverly decompose this generating function, uh, you know, into a part that sums up the Euler numbers and into another part that, uh, you know, somehow gives you the thing from Nielsen's identity and maybe you know, whatever the extension of that is. Okay, well, if you could do that, you're much cleverer with generating functions than I am, because uh, it's uh, you know it's kind of hard to. Uh, um, this formula talk is just equivalent, I think, to Kolbe's identity in z is minus one. Just the same. If you write the generating function of these integrals. Oh, you mean write the integral function as a hypergeometric? Yeah, yeah. This is exactly the same. This is just expanding the coefficient. Okay. Here. So, so, so if you like, it, so say this is well known. Cool. That's a one-line proof of this yeah. identity. But uh, one thing you can prove from this generating function, which is sort of an amusing curiosity, which is that if you add up all the <laughs> zeta n plus one bar with more and more ones on them, it gives you uh, zeta n bar. I mean, that's, that's just a weird curiosity. I mean, it's true for any n, um, one and n. But uh, I, I guess uh, sort of a, a dream is that this hypergeometric function, or you know, equivalently the integral, could somehow be written into as a sum of You know, the, you know, this this could be subbed into something using the 
Or the Paul Dalgas is the that would be sort of another piece that would give you a piece there. Right? But that's, uh, that's only a dream. I don't know how to do it. Conjecture. Um, go back to slides also, but we'll talk so I can see that. Yes. Okay, no, I'm asking you to go back to conjecture. Okay. Oh, oh, Doesn't matter. Oh, but on conjecture. the conjecture, um, yeah. so Claire Glanwine, her thesis, um, uh, wrote down a criterion for an alternating sum to be expressible as multiple values. Oh, okay. And as a general recipe, you take an alternating sum and then you sort of correct it with terms, and it often involves inserting lots of ones. So oh. this training sequence of ones looks very familiar. Oh, okay. And I was wondering um, if there's something in that thesis that might... That so, might so be. was this published? Or? Yeah, uh, well, actually I don't know, but it's available. Oh, okay. okay. And, so, that um, probably was so what it does is if, if you have some explicit <laughs> linear combination of alternating sums and you want to check it's a multiple zeta, you do some combinatorial thing to it, and it will prove, it can typically prove that it is a polynomial in single zetas. But it won't give you all the coefficients. So it, it's right. along the lines of the things that you need to do. Yeah, so this. You have this piece. So, from my point of view, it's. Uh, oh, sorry. So, so there's the there's the projection. Yeah, so it looks from this, yeah. this trailing ones looks, looks yeah. familiar somehow. So it's. Somehow it's saying that uh, all the, the even ones, you know, contain the odd ones. With these, with these Euler numbers as coefficients, which is, you know, I, I, as, as I was fiddling around with the integral, you know, I, I was sort of doing it out term by term, and it was sort of a complete surprise to me when I recognized that these two are in fact just zeros of the Euler, well, coefficients of the Euler, or Euler numbers. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the idea that uh, you know if you, if you made a generated function out of these, uh, you could somehow uh, sort of separate the pieces somehow because you could well, okay so you got even to die on one side but the point is uh, if you if you fiddle with that you could sort out the terms according to the t. And the, you get kind of a, a generated function version of that. But, uh, the, the problem is that the part you get by sort of adding up the, the Euler polynomials isn't a very attractive, and I don't even know what goes here because uh, I don't sort of have a you know, general version of this. This is even true. But, but it's you know, not entirely. Impossible, it might be something. Yeah. Question? No more questions? What is, what is this polynomial which we have written? Excuse me? You have written some polynomials. They say polynomial in zeta 2, zeta 3, but what form it has? No, there's no conjecture about the form. Excuse me. Yeah. Is it conjecture? You have a polynomial. I think yes. you can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Simply, it's this is just a rational function. It's an unknown. Well, polynomial. It's uh, a special polynomial. No, no, I, 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 I don't presume to say what it is. I, I, I don't know what it is. Okay. Uh, except, okay, I know what it is when k is one. Sure. Yeah. yeah then, then it's then it's this guy. Yeah, sure. uh, and you know, I sort of well, guess so that it has this form when k is two. Uh, and I have. I really don't know. But you don't even know what the RNs are, you do? No, I don't. But you know the first Fendi of them, right? Yeah, I know the first five. And so it's very easy to compute these things numerically, the right position. Well, the okay. Numbers. But if you. Okay. Yeah, but it's homogeneous somehow. Oh, it's, it's all homogeneous. It's homogeneous, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Right. That would contradict every conjecture in the field. No, no, if you could find a, a relation among multiple zeta values or alternating ones, it's not homogeneous by weight. Uh, okay, no, send it to the end. That, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a big surprise. Could you roll back? Excuse me? Oh, conjecture. Yeah. 
So, another question? Okay, if not, we should thank Michael for a great talk.